from Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus. Welcome to Middle East Focus. I'm Alistair Taylor, MEI's Editorial Director, and today we're going to be talking about energy and geopolitics in the Eastern Mediterranean. There's been growing interest in the region's energy resources over the past decade. Driven by major offshore discoveries like the Tamar and Leviathan fields in Israel in 2009-2010, the Aphrodite field in Cyprus in 2011, and the Zohar field in Egypt in 2015, as well as more recent finds. The politics of regional energy cooperation, however, are complicated. And to discuss the situation, I'm joined by two of my colleagues here at MEI, Marit Mabruk and Rauf Mamadov. Marit is the head of the Egypt program here, and Rauf is an energy policy expert. All right, Ralph, thank you both for joining me today, and welcome to the program. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Ralph, I'd like to start with you. There's been a lot of excitement in the region about an energy boom, but can you give us some kind of context for how big these finds actually are and how important the Eastern Mediterranean is from a, a kind of global energy perspective? And these are very significant developments, findings, as we call them, for different reasons. First of all, not so many conventional fields left to be explored by the major companies. All the new volumes are coming from shale or from very deep, deep water, pre-salt wells and fields in Brazil or any other parts of the world. So from that perspective, this is a very, very significant finding. Another important factor is the proximity of the found fields to the major markets and the location of the fields on the crossroads of the routes to the major markets. Uh, in this case, it's Europe, one of the largest consumers of gas, and East Med fields are located within almost 1,000 kilometers of the European shores. And another important factor is the locality of the issue, how these fields are important for the developers and the countries that own these areas. Because there's a pattern we see that most of these countries that own these fields and have been leased to major companies, they used to be major importer of gas or oil. And from that perspective, it's major development for them to become not only self-sufficient, but also exporter of the gas. Absolutely. Murat, on that point, how much of an impact have these discoveries had within the, the kind of Eastern Mediterranean? Egypt, I know, is a particularly instructive case because it went from being a kind of importer to now an exporter as of the end of last year. How much of a, an impact has it had? It's had a significant effect, but not for the reason that people sometimes think. I think Rauf outlined everything very clearly, but you want to bear in mind that these discoveries actually make up about 1% of the world's total. But they are important for the region, not only because many of these countries are going to go to self-sufficiency. For Egypt, it's especially important because... Not only was Egypt an importer, it was finding it difficult to get the gas. I mean, we had pipelines that were attacked you know, 17 times in one year after the 2011 revolution. And everyone in Egypt remembers, and especially the government and especially businesses, remembers factories operating at 40 percent consistently for most of the year and blackouts that lasted four to six hours in many cases. So this has been a huge relief. But it's not just a relief in terms of the actual gas. In Egypt's case, it's going to be self-sufficient and we'll be able to export a little gas. But the biggest uh, gains, I think, are going to be political because it does set up a new regional power play, which Egypt intends to be center stage in. Who's involved in the offshore exploration and production in the region? Is there a lot of international IOC interest? We don't see major companies, we haven't seen major companies start the process for the same reason that it was an uncharted territory. It's very difficult for major companies to include these unknown fields to their balance sheet and then try to develop it. So what started with Houston-based Noble, which is a medium-sized oil company, it's not one of those major sevens sisters, and Delek, the Israeli company, then it shifted towards, in Egypt's case, for example, it was more companies that has been involved in Egypt for a long time and also in Lebanon as well. For instance, ENI, ENI has been in Egypt for decades, for seven decades already, and it's their backyard. And Total has been in Lebanon for 60, 70 years for different purposes. But overall, we see companies more interested now, and that's one of the reasons why these projects are very important, because it attracts more interest. One of the companies that are showing great significance to the region is Exxon. They've been drilling in Cyprus, in Israeli waters, in the East 
Smith Basin, and more companies are involved, we'll see many other companies come as well. Having said that, Russian companies are very active. Rosneft has bought 30% of Zohar. Novatech also won bidding for Lebanese blocks. And we see a lot of Russian interest in the region. These are major companies, both Rosneft and Novatech. Novatech actually became the largest supplier of LNG to Europe in the first quarter of 2019. And Rosneft is increasing LNG portfolio in their overall balance. So we see interest, but the companies are careful for the same reasons as Miret mentioned, for geopolitical reasons, for some commercial reasons as well. The findings are big for the region, but in a global scale, it's only 1%. These are up to 200 BCM billion cubic meters, 800 billion cubic meters in case of Zohar, up to 1 trillion, which are considered as elephant fields, as we call it in the industry, but they're far from being South Pars, which is 51 trillion. So these aspects are factored in when the major companies enter the market. There is an interest, but they're taking it very slowly. Not a new Qatar, but significant for the region, certainly. Merit, we're talking about Egypt offshore, we're talking about Lebanon, we're talking about Cyprus, we're talking about ultimately a pretty diverse group of producers across a wide area. How do you tie all that together and, and ultimately get the gas to the consumers in Europe? Yeah, very carefully. Um, <laughs> the big players here ultimately are Egypt, Israel, and Cyprus. And everyone's talking about pipelines, but there is sort of one existing pipeline. And then the pipeline that they're talking about between Egypt, Israel and Cyprus is supposedly going to be finished in 2024, 2025. The big Israeli pipeline will almost certainly never be built because it just you know, won't make sense. And you have to bear in mind that the technology is changing. Now, for transportation, Egypt has two LNG platforms already existing in Etku and Damietta. They're great, but again, the technology is changing, so certainly no one's going to be making any big infrastructure investments because you don't know what it's going to look like in four years' time. So I think what people want to look at in a more holistic sense is the amount of gas being produced, and even though it's small, I mean, since 2009, in the region, over, I can correct me on this if I'm wrong, it's like 2.1 trillion cubic meters, and so for clarification, in 2017, Europe imported 410 billion. So there's an enormous amount here. And the market is really, the, you have to look at the geography, the market is really Europe. And that's really what you want to look at. Not so much the physics, which is maybe down the road in some cases, but secured in others. But really, it doesn't have to go that far. Yeah, the comparison is great. Russia supplied only 200 billion cubic meters to Europe. If you look at the numbers, what the region has, the potential is there. Regarding the Itku and Damietta terminals, when they were actually exporting gas before Egypt started importing gas in 2013, I guess, most of the volumes went to Asia. With the new contracts signed between Cyprus and ITCO, between Cyprus government and Shell, who operates the terminal, and with the arbitration settled between Damietta, Fenagas, and Segas, and then the government, the new volumes will be definitely delivered to these terminals. And given that the price difference between the Asian benchmark and Europe has declined significantly, and we see that more American gas going to Europe for the same reason, as I agree with Muret that it, when the gas is there, uh, more of the volumes will be directed to Europe, which is becoming more dependent on import gas. Although the consumption rates are remaining relatively steady, we don't see much growth, but since the declining production within the Europe from the Netherlands, from North Sea, requires more LNG and more gas to be imported, and this is where EastMed can play in. Murat, what are the kind of major factors helping or hindering energy cooperation? Okay, so helping, the bottom line is always a huge motivator, and these countries stand to make more money working together than not. And there's also the fact that countries like Cyprus, which are smaller and significantly more vulnerable, have a lot to gain from cozying up to larger countries like Egypt or Israel. And Egypt, Greece, and Cyprus signed a security agreement back in 2015 that really just sort of talks about um, it's more economic than military, but although they do military exercises, none of this is NATO-based. No one is going to go to war to protect anyone else. But still, there are some very serious commercial ties. So it would be a hindrance to any sort of aggression. But 
what it really boils down to is is money. These countries stand to make a lot of money working together. I mean, they have resources that are, are in common, and in some cases, some countries have an existing infrastructure that the others can sort of you know piggyback on. So it, it works out well for everyone. Hindering is really regional tensions. I mean, I think Rolf can can speak better to that, but Turkey's position at the moment is tossing up a fair amount of concern. I think that's the biggest hindrance. Yeah. The main the main uh, issue. We'll, we'll get into that in a little bit more detail in a second, but I wanted to, on the kind of more positive regional cooperation front, touch on one of this year's big developments, which was the launch of the Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum in January as hosted by Egypt. Can you kind of maybe delve into that a little bit more? Who was involved? How big a deal is that as you see it? Okay, so it was actually a fairly big deal. And I think it was a big deal in two senses, one on the commercial side and one on the the political side. And that on the political side, it's easier. Egypt is trying to reclaim a regional role and regional prominence that has been quite seriously knocked since the 2011 revolution. On the commercial side, what these countries did was they put together a forum which essentially works out how and why and when to excavate, to dig up money, to cooperate. They talked about creating systemic dialogues and independence and benefits. And what that really means is cooperation. That's why it's called a forum rather than anything else, because it needs to be fairly loosey-goosey so that it can develop as things come up, whether it's technology or aggression or, or anything else. But it was, it is very, very important. And all the energy ministers of all the countries were there. I think it was Egypt, Israel, Cyprus, Greece, Jordan, Palestine. There's one, one I mean, Italy. Italy, Italy, Italy. was there. Italy. Not Lebanon. Lebanon. Yeah, Lebanon. Exactly. Well, there, are, there are two big things missing. One is Lebanon, because, of course, Lebanon is at war with Israel. And the other one is Turkey, because, uh, you know, Turkey. So again, Rolf could probably go into detail about that. So it is important. I mean, if you look at it as another geopolitical commercial hub to offset, you know, whether it's European claims or US claims or Russian claims, it's important. It's important also because the East Med is so fragmented politically and commercially. And we see the simultaneous process going on in Southeastern Europe, which is also fragmented infrastructurally and less politically, although there are differences. It's important to see these two hubs try to create some coherence at the same time. And then if it goes well, when there's gas, then these two hubs can be merged, which can be helpful both for the suppliers and the importers as well in terms of making money and for Europe decreasing its dependence on Russia. On the uh, kind of turkey point that uh, has been raised a couple of times, it does seem to be the uh, the biggest odd man out of this whole dynamic. What's your kind of read on that? How does turkey factor into the kind of broader equation? Ankara feels disenfranchised from whole process for different reasons. First of all, Turkey has been struggling to find its own oil and gas reserves since since There's I remember. There's virtually no reserves and whatsoever. they have yeah. failed. You know, we have this Canadian company, Valera, I think drilling in Black Sea. There have been some other attempts, but onshore and offshore, but so far to no avail. And also politically, geopolitically, Turkey had issues with Israel, with Cyprus, for the obvious reasons. And Turkey doesn't recognize any border delimitation or economic zones between all the agreements made between Cyprus and Israel, Egypt and Israel, Egypt and Cyprus. They did not recognize it. I'm I'm a little bit optimistic in terms of their actions, and I've seen some progress. You know, they have called back the Barbaros, that famous vessel that had been trying to hinder the process. It will be difficult to bring Turkey into this community because of those differences. But again, the bottom line factor, if it's there and if international community, all these countries build their strategy on the idea that not only zero sum approach, but on the idea that both Egypt and Greece and Turkey can be uh, major hubs and transit countries and their connection, their coordination will only enhance their positions and make them more susceptible to this process. In that case, uh, Turkey can come to the board. But I think it will require more 
package deal, more comprehensive approach. There are outstanding issues that has been there for decades, for, for longer than I, I've lived, and it will require more in-depth negotiation with Turkey to bring them on the table. It does seem certainly that the Turkey would have a lot to offer in the sense of being kind of a large regional country. Geographically, of course, it's kind of in the middle of where all these things want to happen. Um, it's a huge importer of gas as it stands. So it seems like if they can, they could find a way, there would be a lot of upsides to tying them into all of this as well. One clarification about Turkey, unlike Egypt, I mean, here I'm talking about from a technical standpoint, unlike Egypt, which has more chances to become a gas hub, Turkey still had to work on the technical side as well. There's a difference between being a gas hub and a gas transit country. And the difference lies in the fact that you have to have liberalized market, which Egypt has been doing for last three, four years, hasn't finished it yet, but still doing it. And what's more important, Egypt has a lot of gas storages which Turkey doesn't have. So this, you have to have these two components in order to become flexible to load the, the gas. Also on the uh, Turkey front, politics plays a role between Turkey and Egypt too. Um, certainly been a kind of longstanding conflict there. How does that factor in, Marit? Okay, so relations between Egypt and Turkey have been fractious, to put it politely, since the ouster of former President Mohamed Morsi, where things took a steep nosedive and have not yet pulled up. However, Turkey is currently getting about 3% of its gas from Egypt. So it would be to Turkey's advantage to hop on the wagon here. All right. Now, on the one hand, it may be that these issues will distract from various issues that Turkey is having at home. It's, it's always a good political ploy. However, it really would be in Turkey's interest to hop on the wagon here. Now, there are, for example, Turkey doesn't recognize the treaty between Egypt, Greece and Cyprus that was signed back in 2013. It doesn't recognize it. But I don't know if it's in Turkey's interest or that Turkey will have the bandwidth to continue to antagonize Egypt, Israel, Cyprus, Greece, Italy. Now, you could argue that it already has fairly fractious relations with all of them anyway. But still, during a time when it really would be in Turkey's interest to perhaps try and inject a little prosperity back home into an already uncertain economic situation, it would probably serve Turkey well. Um, certainly, on the Egyptian side, this government has made it extremely clear they are not in the slightest bit interested in any military conflicts or conflicts really of any sort anywhere. So it would take a lot to move anyone. And it doesn't hurt that Egypt is the region's largest land army. But just on the commercial side, it would be better if everybody got on. But I think Turkey is going to have to step up if it chooses to do so. I don't know that it chooses to do so at the moment. I don't really see it. I'm not a Turkey expert. But it is getting 3% of its gas from Egypt. So this may be an opportunity. Not only, not only it gets more 3% uh, of gas from Egypt, yeah. but it also relying more on imported LNG and from Algeria, uh, from Qatar. And now these countries have better proximity to Turkey than Qatar or Algeria in that case. And we see the current pricing environment dictates you know, preference to LNG. And in this case, these countries can only benefit that. And one example I can give, when that famous dispute between Erdogan in Davos, where he made that scandal, after that, you know, the relation between Israel and Turkey has gone nose down. But regardless, uh, the trade turnover between two countries actually doubled since then. So money matters, money talks here. And I hope that will be the case with East Med and Turkey as well. Absolutely. Um, so circling back to the kind of EU uh, as role in all of this, can you maybe speak, Ralph, a little bit about how the Eastern Mediterranean fits into the EU's kind of bid to diversify and secure its supplies and diversify away from Russian supplies in particular? Yeah, as we know, Russia, uh, Russia supplies almost 37, 36 percent of Europe's imports. And despite the sanctions, they have actually break the record of supplies for the last two years. It's a huge problem. It's a pipeline gas, which is a lot cheaper than LNG. And it's very hard to compete. The only pipeline project they have at the moment is from Azerbaijan, from my home country, South Caucasus pipeline. But the capacity is only 10 billion cubic meters compared to up to 200 billion cubic meters to Europe and Turkey. Having said that, the southeastern Europe is, as I mentioned before, is very fragmented. But also from the upper hand is that the import capacity and also the consumption in these countries, except the Italy, is not that much. For instance, Bulgaria only consumes 3 billion cubic meters, which is 
uh, not that much in compared to what Italy or what Egypt consumes almost 70 billion cubic meters. Um, uh, so it's it makes sense to to include this region to use it as alternative supply. But however, from all the agreements we have seen and, and Red mentioned some of them, all the pipeline agreements have been so far not to north but to the west uh, towards Egypt, Jordan. Whether it's contracts or MOUs, memorandum of understandings, or any kind of agreements, it's either been with uh, the Palestinian Authority, Jordan. And most of them have been between Cyprus and Egypt, Israel and Egypt. The only reason is that the infrastructure is there. The pan Arab pipeline is there. It has been built a decade ago. It hasn't been functional for, for, for obvious reasons. But the companies will always choose to use the existing pipelines and existing infrastructure because these projects, when you make a final investment decision for these projects, first priority is the logistics. How, how will you get your gas to the market? And the companies will always go for the most cost efficient way. And that's the existing pipelines. If you want to build a pipeline, Eastern Mediterranean pipeline that they talk about, it's 1,200 kilometers. Just to put it in context, it's from here to Key West, Florida. Subsea pipeline, $7 billion price tag with a lot of geopolitical issues, where it will go through, who will build the pipeline, who will finance it. Yes, Europe is, has allocated some resources as a, as a project of interest to East Mediterranean pipeline, but it's less than $100 million. It's just for research. So as Mirette mentioned, bottom line is very important. The commerciality, the feasibility of the pipeline is very important. There is a potential to connect the pipeline to TAP Trans Adriatic Pipeline, which has a spare capacity, which is a scalable pipeline, which means adding several pipes, you can expand the capacity. But so far, we have only seen... Uh, all the logistical solutions towards Egypt, towards neighboring countries, and using the existing infrastructure. We're running short on time, but Mirette, where do you think things will go from here? I'm actually quite hopeful. I, we keep saying the bottom line, but it really is in everyone's interest to get the things going. So there's been international interest, and the U.S. finally caught on to the fact that this might be a good idea. I think, and um, I think it's actually asked for observer status on the Eastern Mediterranean Forum. I don't know that they'll get it, basically, because if you allow the U.S., then you should allow everyone else, and it might might just get messy. But I. I do think that what you're looking at, at the very least, is the ability for many of these countries to work on their research and development. I mean, a lot of these countries are investing in renewable energy as well, because, I mean, everyone knows that it's, it, it's, it's foolish to count on natural resources because they run out. And uh, a lot of these countries have rapidly expanding populations. And I think what this will do is give them the breathing space to be able to sort out other issues that they're going to have down the road. It's not that they're going to make oodles of money, but it does allow them, and this is where the geopolitics comes in, it allows them breathing space and it allows them a certain amount of independence. So there's going to be less pressure from other internationals. I think that that's the most important thing. We'll have to leave things here, but uh, Mirette, Rauf, thank you both for joining me on the program today. Thank, thank you. you for having us. And uh, thank you as well to our audience for listening in and to our production team for their work on today's program. We will see all of you next week. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support.